The humanist is asked to define worship by Kendall Gibbons. There is a moment after the student minister has announced the housekeeping of the people of God, after the reading of words familiar and always new, as the flute player draws breath and the last page settles on the lectern and the lady behind me coughs gently when I am wholly happy and at rest. The preacher waits with a saving word. I know the tension, but not today. Instead, this gracious suspense, while the store-bought roses stretch their petals, not to any incoming bee, but just for the beauty of the things. For this I was made, this loveliness of known order, measured movement of thought in stillness, and something more basic than thought. There is a moment when all things gather themselves toward intention, and I am gathered and glad. Light holds just before the note sounds in this pure space overflowing with thanks. <clears throat> So in his book, The End of God Talk, a humanist scholar, Dr. Anthony Penn, writes that God is a symbol, a human construct, a human construct that no longer functions, that no longer carries the weight of the job it was meant to do. Now I consider myself a theist, which to me means that I believe in something larger, something sacred and divine, something that is mysterious, that exists in us and among us. But I'm also able to accept Dr. Pinn's statement that God is a human construct that no longer functions. And I hold these ideas simultaneously, and I will tell you why. Seventeen years ago, I quit drinking and using drugs, and I did this through the 12 steps. When I first got sober, I was told by my support group sponsor to pray to the God of my understanding to keep me clean. The trouble was, the God of my understanding, the one with which I was raised, had already made it clear that there were parts of me and parts of what I believed that were unacceptable. This God and I had already gone through what you might call a conscious uncoupling. <laughs> and I felt we were both pretty okay with the decision. <laughs> My sponsor suggested that perhaps the God I had been taught about was not the God for me, and that it was time to define for myself the God of my understanding. So I took her advice and I went home and I wrote down everything that I thought the perfect God would be. The one that I would actually want to be in a relationship with. And then I prayed to that God and I chose to believe in that God even when it felt silly. Even when there was clear evidence to the contrary, even when I was faking it. It is a familiar refrain in recovery circles to say, if it was up to me, I'd be drunk right now. I've said it myself over the years, as evidence that something larger than myself is responsible for my sobriety. How else would this be possible? for an addict to be alive and free of the compulsion to drink and use, except through some divine intervention. For many years, my existence was proof for me of God's existence. My own salvation, proof that it is a benevolent universe, 
Somebody up there cares about me. I matter. I was saved. But then I met Dr. Anthony Penn, who I quoted earlier. He taught one of my classes in seminary. And I read all his books on African American humanism. And his books challenged me on my God. In one of his books, Dr. Penn writes, liberation theologians have made a, a faulty assumption that God is good, that he is on the side of the oppressed. But based on the evidence, God is not about the business of liberation. I thought about this a lot. Hadn't I been liberated? I had evidence, my own existence. But then I couldn't help but ask myself, if everyone is inherently worthy, why doesn't God liberate everyone? This was impossible to explain. How can I believe in a God that saves me and yet chooses not to save so many others who struggle with the same demons? Is this God my God alone, my own personal savior? Or perhaps this God simply thinks I am more worthy of saving? I have prayed to this God for the liberation of many of my fellow addicts, but most of those people were never saved, including several friends who died from drug overdoses, family members who passed away from alcohol-related illnesses, and people I dearly love right now who are in the grips of active addiction. In coming to terms with this, I realized I had more evidence to consider. So my God, the human creation, admittedly, that I believed in for so long, a belief that sustained me and saved me, can no longer carry the weight of the job that it is meant to do. Because I'm no longer concerned with just my salvation. My Unitarian Universalist faith actually calls me to something more. It calls me to be a part of life here on earth, real life, real community with other human beings. When I take my eyes off of heaven, my belief that I have been chosen to be liberated, and instead look to the reality that so many people still suffer, I realize what I am now being called to believe. It's not about me and God. It never was. There were people all along the way <coughs> helping me, supporting me, believing in me. My community of people, not saints. <coughs> Imperfect people right here on earth whose love for me called us both into deeper relationship. People who were willing to tell me hard truths who never gave up on me. This love is the holy thing that saved me. And my personal sense of peace and wholeness, that through this love I learned to trust, was not the end goal of my spiritual journey. So let me say that again, because I think it's important that my own sense of peace and wholeness was not the goal of my spiritual journey. It only ever existed to serve what came next, which is likely not the end either. I'll tell you when I get there. <laughs> but right now, <laughs> I am convinced, if you feel you have been liberated from something, you are charged with loving others as you have been loved, and to keep your eyes on this messy earth and figure out how and where you can be of service to those who still suffer. As Unitarian Universalists, we need to have the courage to investigate our symbols because we are in service to humanity. 
We are stuck here together, come what may. And perhaps there is a God out there who will like you better than your neighbor. But if our faith calls us to care about what happens to our neighbor, what use is that God anyway? Thankfully, consciously uncoupling with our tired symbols is not the end of the story. Our relationship to that which is holy and sacred is reborn repeatedly. In place of the old symbols, we can make new ones. And when we keep our eyes on the earth, we begin to see the gifts all around us. The spirit of life that lives right here in us, in the earth, in flora and fauna, in all the potential and kinetic energy that can neither be created nor destroyed. Just this past week, I went into the woods with a friend of mine and picked nettles and made them into soup. Nettles. They are a prickly, stinging weed. If you've ever touched one, you know that you only need to barely brush up against it to cause a welt to rise on your skin that lasts for days. The tips of my fingers that I used to pick the nettles on Thursday are still a little bit numb. And yet somehow, the stinging nettle is delicious and really good for you. And even though they sting your skin so bad, you can eat them and they nourish you. In springtime, when they are at their best, you can stir fry them and put them into soup and they relieve allergies and lower blood pressure. This is just a small, sacred thing that I did to honor the springtime and find joy in the season. And having this holy moment is not dependent on believing in God. Every day, we can go out into this messy, beautiful world, brave the sting of the nettles on our fingertips, and turn our harvest into food for our body and our spirit. We can make meaning from our humble human experiences right here on earth. And this act of making meaning, honoring what is sacred about being a living part of this living planet, has the power to liberate ourselves and others. It is our journey as humans, and it is holy in and of itself. As theologian Barbara Brown Taylor writes, what is saving my life now is the conviction that there is no spiritual treasure to be found apart from the bodily experiences of human life on earth. My life depends on engaging the most ordinary physical activities with the most exquisite attention I can give them. My life depends on ignoring all touted distinctions between the secular and the sacred, the physical and the spiritual, the body and the soul. What is saving my life now is becoming more fully human, trusting that there is no way to God apart from real life in the real world. Personally, I'm not interested in looking heavenward and taking my eyes off of what is happening right here on Earth. The world is a mess, a beautiful, awful mess. The result of me getting sober is that I found out I actually kind of like it here in this mess. It's my tingly fingertips that tell me I'm alive. Every day, I want to be out here among the stinging nettles of the world, knowing that joy and pain are intertwined. 
and that being alive itself is sacred and holy. And I would like to take a moment to give gratitude to all the gods I have loved in my life, the ones who no longer serve me, the ones with whom I have consciously uncoupled. I thank you for your faithful service, and I release you. <laughs> As Dr. Penn tells us, God is not dead. All along, it was just a symbol a symbol that requires constant revision. In a world where the old gods are seemingly not about the business of liberation, we can be encouraged by the fact that we as Unitarian Universalists are about the business of liberation. We are called to believe in the sacredness of our humanity and to refuse to surrender to anything but love. We are called to fight for everyone's right to engage in a quest to make meaning of their own lives, to couple and uncouple with the gods of their understanding forever ad infinitum. And each one of us gets to define for ourselves what that means. As you use, we are called to continue to investigate our symbols, to be brave and let go of the gods that don't serve us, so we can get to work serving what is holy and sacred about life right here on earth. Amen. Blessed be you.